During this Lenten season, I'm doing a sermon series on encounters with Jesus, ways that Jesus has changed the lives of individuals and on groups of people, communities. One of the things I love about scripture is that it is at the same time both ancient and current. Let me give you just a word of context about this passage from John. This is an example of identity politics at its worst. Historically, the Jews and the Sumerians or Samaritans were deeply divided. It had gone on for generation upon generation upon generation. The divide was religious, it was ethnic, it was cultural, it was political, and there was mutual hatred and uncertainty and animosity between those two groups of people. Hear now about this encounter that Jesus has, Jesus, a Jew, has with a Sumerian woman. He left Judea and started back to Galilee, but he had to go through Samaria. So he came to a Samaritan city called Sychar near a plot of ground that Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired out by his journey, was sitting by the well. It was about noon. A Samaritan woman came to draw water, and Jesus said to her, Give me a drink. His disciples had gone to the city to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, How is it that you, a Jew, ask a drink of me, a woman of Samaria? Jews did not share things in common with Samaritans, and that is the understatement of the century. Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that is saying to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. The woman said to him, sir, you have no bucket and the well is deep. Where do you get that living water? Are you greater than our ancestor Jacob who gave us the well and with his sons and his flocks drank from it? Jesus said to her, everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again. But those who drink of the water that I give them will never be thirsty. The water that I will give will become in them a spring of water gushing up to eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I may never be thirsty or have to keep coming here to draw water. Jesus said to her, Go call your husband and come back. The woman answered, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, You are right in saying, I have no husband, for you have had five husbands, and the one you have now is not your husband. What you have said is true. The woman said to him, Sir, I see that you are a prophet. Our ancestors worshipped on this mountain, but you say that the place where people must worship is in Jerusalem. Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know, for salvation is from the Jews. But the hour is coming and is now here when the true worshipers will worship the Father 
in spirit and truth, for the Father seeks such as these to worship him. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. The woman said to him, I know that Messiah is coming, who is called Christ. When he comes, he will proclaim all things to us. Jesus said to her, I am he, the one who is speaking to you. Just then his disciples came. They were astonished that he was speaking with a woman, but no one said, what are you, what do you want, or why are you speaking with her? Then the woman left her water jar and went back to the city. She said to the people, come and to see a man who told me everything I have ever done. He cannot be the Messiah, can he? They left the city and were on their way to him. And then I move to verse 39. Many Samaritans from that city believed in him because of the woman's testimony. He told me everything I have ever done. My brothers and sisters, this is the living word from our living God. Let us all say, thanks be to God. And will you pray with me? Word of God living in and among us. Speak to us of your spirit and your truth. Amen. If you were going to start a new church, who would you want to join it? Would it be a teacher? Maybe Greg. Hmm? Or a musician? Right, Tim? Perhaps a carpenter or electrician perhaps a nurse to care for the sick, or a cook to provide fellowship and hospitality. Maybe you would want to include some youth and children for excitement and energy, and a local banker, of course, to help pay the bills. If I were going to start a new church, I would make sure that we had at least one Samaritan woman. You want to know why? Because if you have her, you've soon got a thriving body of believers. Let's meet this woman. It is noontime in the Middle East, a time of day you would not expect to see people working outside. Most folk are inside somewhere trying to escape the blistering heat. Nevertheless, this woman is heading to the village well with an empty jar perched high on her head. In the ancient world, women went to the well every day, usually in the cool of the early morning or in the evening, not in the heat of midday. It was a difficult chore. The walk was often long and the water was always heavy. But it wasn't an altogether unpleasant chore. Women gathered at the village well to tell their stories, to share their recipes, to catch up on the latest gossip. Think Facebook, old days. It was important community time for them. This unnamed Samaritan woman was doing this back-breaking chore in the heat of the day. Why? We really don't know. Perhaps she was a poor household manager. 
Perhaps she was entertaining company from out of town and ran out of water too early in the day. Perhaps someone had knocked over, over the water jug and it had spilled out the precious contents. Maybe she was restless, trying to sort out a difficult problem and needed to get away and just think. Or perhaps she went to the well alone at midday because she wanted to avoid the other women. Many biblical commentators call her character into question. We know she had been married five times and was living with a sixth man who was not her husband. So she may have been fodder for vicious gossip among the other women. If so, it would have been less painful to go to the well alone and avoid the malicious whispers of other women. At any rate, she approaches the well and sees a man sitting there. No problem. This woman knows how to deal with men. <laughs> and the stranger's dress indicates he is Jewish. So she knows he, she will be safe. A stranger's dress tells her that this Jew will not bother her, will not touch her, will not talk to her. So she approaches the well quietly, intending, I think, to do her business and then leave quickly. But as soon as she puts her jar down, the stranger asks her for a drink. What? <laughs> I'm confused, she says. How is it that you, a Jew, ask me, a Sumerian woman, for anything? Friends, already this stranger, this man, has leapt across every barrier of bigotry and prejudice. He has looked beyond her gender, her ethnicity, to see her personhood. This remarkable conversation continues. Jesus offers the woman living water, and again she's puzzled. You don't have a bucket or a rope to draw from the well. Besides, since when is your water better than the water our ancestor Jacob provided? This water has been good enough for my people, for our flocks, for generations. The stranger replies, the living water I offer will change your life, will forever quench your thirst. Now that sounds good, says the woman. No more trips to the well in the heat of the day. I want some of that water. It's odd to me in the course of this story that now this stranger, Jesus, changes the subject. He says, Go and get your husband and bring him with you. Now, isn't that out of the blue? The woman comes clean. I don't have a husband. Without missing a beat, the stranger tells it like it is. That's right, he says. You have had five husbands, and the man you're with is not your husband. Now, I want us to notice here that Jesus confronts this woman with the truth, but he does not condemn her. Instead of offering judgment, he offers acceptance, hope, and even the possibility of change. It causes me to wonder, wouldn't it be amazing if you and I consistently treated other people that way. You see, truth plus grace opens the door for transformation. Now let's take a closer look at this Samaritan woman. I wonder, when I read this text, what is her backstory? Is she the Liz Taylor of Samaria? 
Or is she this poor soul who just keeps repeating the same mistakes, husband after husband, man after man, loser after loser? Or is something else going on here, I wonder? I happen to know that in Jesus' time, the average adult lifespan was only about 30 to 35 years. So maybe this woman was widowed five times. It's possible. Or perhaps this poor lady is infertile and in ancient time, a woman's primary purpose was to bear children. Divorce was easy to obtain. So if a man's wife failed to bear him a child very quickly, he could simply abandon her and divorce her with the words, I divorce you. That's all it took. Whatever was the cause of her unfortunate marital history, we, when we read this story, we tend to determine her intrinsic worth with the words 500 husbands and live in man. Don't we do that to people, don't we? But that's not what Jesus does. He sees her potential, not just her past. Jesus treats her as someone of value and worth. And again, what if the church were to treat everybody like that? If we did, I think you and I would fall in love with this feisty woman We'd recognize that she's bright and curious, that she's eager to learn about matters of faith. And so while some commentators suggest that when Jesus exposes her sin, the woman changes the subject, but I'd rather think that there's something different going on here. I think she changes the subject because she recognizes that she is in the presence of a prophet and she is interested in the things of God and she is seizing the moment to ask all of the questions that she's always wondered about. Where are we supposed to worship? In Jerusalem or at Mount Gerizim? Which style, what style of worship is most pleasing to God, traditional or contemporary? Is it with the Jews or with the Sumerians? When will the Messiah come? How and when and where can I find God? And then this feisty, curious woman ends with the wistful statement of hope and faith. When Messiah comes, all these mysteries will finally be revealed. As she speaks these words, I can imagine there must have been another question in her mind. Don't you think she wonders, could this be the Messiah, the Christ? I want this woman in my church, don't you? She is thirsty to know God. She is a seeker, and God says, if with all your heart you truly seek me, I will let myself be found. Jesus rewards her seeking heart with a startling revelation. Yes, I am the one the world has waited for. Well, well, this story 
continues to be full of surprises, doesn't it? Jesus, you see, is not usually so open about his identity. Remember when his friend, Simon Peter, announces the great confession, you are the Messiah, the Christ, Jesus orders him, be silent, don't tell a soul. And yet now Jesus comes right out and declares himself to a stranger, a woman. He reveals his true identity to a Samaritan woman. Isn't that amazing? Isn't it? Well, next the disciples enter the scene and the woman hurries off, leaving her water jar behind. This now is a woman with a mission, my friends. She abandons that empty water pot, a symbol of her unquenchable thirst, and she runs back to the village, bubbling over with excitement. Freedom and hope are flowing through her veins now, and she tells her family, her friends, her neighbors, come, come, all who have been despised and rejected. Come and meet the one who will not be bound by our identity politics, who will not be bound by our hatred and our prejudice. This man knew everything about me, and he saw who I really was. And he accepted me anyway. Come, she says, all who thirst to know God. Come to worship him in spirit and in truth. Come and drink in the presence of the Messiah, the Savior of the world. And you know what? They came and they believed. In fact, Prior to his death, more people in this Samaritan town of Sychar accepted Jesus as Messiah and Lord than did in any other community in the ancient Near East, anywhere. And it all began with this woman who went for water at midday. I want this woman in our church, don't you? She's thirsty to know God. She's open to experience God in unexpected ways. She's honest enough to recognize her own need. She's willing to risk to trust that Jesus really is who he says he is. And then, my friends, she does something about it. She introduces Jesus to her friends, her family, her neighbors, and acquaintances. How about you? Are you thirsty to know God? Are you ready to trust Jesus really is Emmanuel, God with us? Are you thirsty to receive the living water he offers? Oh, my friends, so often we tend to define ourselves by our past. I'm a recovering addict. I'm a divorcee. I'm a cancer survivor. I'm an adulterer. I'm a loser. And all too often, we as the church define others according to politics, ethnicity, gender, faith expression, whether they're right-handed or left-handed, 
whether you get out of bed feet first, oh gosh knows how many ways we label people unacceptable. God says, come. You are beloved. You are welcome. You are brother and sister and friend of God. I've asked Donna to play in the background for just a moment. And I want you to hear for yourself Christ's invitation to you to come, to drink deeply of his presence, of his welcome, of his acceptance, and also to think about people that you know people that you may come across every day that somehow you have labeled as less than worthy, as less than. And ask God to give you the grace and the trust to offer the welcome of Christ to others in the way that Christ has welcomed you. Let us take this moment to be in the presence and to drink in the presence of Christ right now. Lord Jesus, we hear you call us to come. And we bring all of who we are, our past, our present, our hope for the future, and lay them at your feet. Receive us, O Christ, and give us the grace and the courage to receive all others in your name for surely that is the kind of church you call us to be and to become we thank you O oh god that we have work to do